Section 12 of the History Teachers Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History Teachers Magazine, Volume 1, Number 2, October 1909. Section 12 American History in the Secondary School. Arthur M. Wolfson, Ph.D., Editor. The Influence of Oliver Cromwell and William III on American History. In teaching the history of Europe, from the Treaty of Westphalia to the beginning of the French Revolution, no mistake is commoner than the one of regarding the almost continuous series of wars between the European states as a purposeless struggle for territorial aggrandizement equally in american history the teacher is prone to allow his interest in the growth of social and political institutions to obscure the fact that the north american continent was for nearly a century merely a distant battleground on which holland england and france were struggling for commercial supremacy Unity is given to the history of England in the 18th century, says Seeley, in his Expansion of England on page 77, if you remark the single fact that Greater Britain during that period was establishing itself in opposition to Greater France. You will, I think, find it very helpful in studying the history of those two countries always to bear in mind that throughout most of that period the five states of Western Europe all alike are not properly European states, but world states, and that they debate continually among themselves a mighty question which is not European at all, and which the student with his eye fixed on Europe is too apt to disregard, namely the question of the possession of the New World. In the same way, the student of American history must be continually reminded that he is studying not the history of half a dozen or more isolated communities, but a phase of a great European struggle for world power. Struggle with the Dutch From 1689 to 1763 this struggle is marked by an almost continuous war between France and England. An earlier generation, however, witnessed a similar struggle between Holland and England. This earlier struggle is also vitally important in the history of North America. Few students of American history are aware of the unprecedented growth of the Dutch maritime power during the first half of the seventeenth century to most of them the founding of new netherlands is an isolated fact comparatively unimportant because the dutch colony ultimately fell into the hands of the english the fact nevertheless remains that throughout the greater part of the seventeenth century the carrying trade of the world was in the hands of the dutch and amsterdam was the exchange of the world. What Venice had been in the 15th century, Amsterdam became in the 17th. To break this monopoly was England's object, and to raise his country to a position of leadership in the commercial world was one of the greatest ambitions of Cromwell. Andrew's Colonial Self-Government, page 11, see also page 15. In 1651, at the instance of Cromwell, Parliament passed the first Navigation Act. For the increase of the shipping and the encouragement of the navigation of this, the English nation, in the light of later events, we in America are too apt to regard this act and its successors as designed to limit the trade of the colonies. As a matter of fact, a sufficient study of these acts especially those of 1651 and 1660, will show that they were aimed directly at the Dutch, who were at the time the maritime carriers both for England 
and for the other nations of Europe. The Navigation Acts As a result of the First Navigation Act, England entered almost at once on the series of three wars, 1652 to 1654, 1665 to 1667, 1672 to 1674, which lasted just long enough to break the commercial supremacy of Holland. Every schoolboy knows that as a result of these wars, England acquired the colony of New Netherlands. But few, even of his elders, realize that the Navigation Act which remained substantially in force for nearly two hundred years, is the great legislative monument of the Commonwealth. It was the first manifestation of the newly awakened consciousness of the community, the act which laid the foundation of the English commercial empire. Seeley's Growth of British Policy Chapter 2, page 25 Throughout this period of rivalry between Holland and England, especially after 1660, often against the will of the people, the English government maintained a close alliance with the King of France, the bitterest enemy of the Dutch people. In the last years of the reign of James II, however, the tide of English feeling turned irresistibly against the French alliance. Though James still looked to his cousin, Louis the Fourteenth for aid and comfort, the people of England would have no more of him, and for this reason, as well as for purely domestic reasons, James was in the end forced to flee from the country. Thenceforward there was a complete change in the English foreign policy, the Dutch and English against France. When William of Orange, Stadtholder of Holland, the most uncompromising enemy of Louis the Fourteenth, accepted the crown of England, there came not only a complete revolution in the English constitutional system, but also, and far more important for the history of the American colonies, a complete revolution in England's foreign policy. War between England and France in spite of the traditional rivalry handed down from the Plantagenet times, had been extremely rare. Englishmen and Frenchmen had lived peacefully side by side for half a century or more in the northeastern part of North America, while Englishmen and Dutchmen were struggling for the possession of territory between Long Island Sound and Delaware Bay. Henceforth, the English and the Dutch were to fight side by side, in the effort to break the power of Louis the Magnificent, both in Europe and in America. Just as between 1651 and 1689, it was the first interest of the English that the maritime power of the Dutch should be broken. So now, it was a first interest of England that the encroachments of France should be arrested and that the Dutch should be saved from destruction. The rivalry between the English and Dutch must cease. The two sea powers must combine in opposition to France. Seeley, in his Growth of British Policy, Chapter 2, page 207. How efficiently William III set this policy in motion is attested by the history of Europe and America in the 18th century though he personally never realized the magnitude of the issue, though from first to last he was primarily interested in the preservation of Holland, though he had realized that his work was to result in the aggrandizement of England at the expense both of Holland and France, he would probably never have accepted the English throne. The far-reaching effects of this policy are to be seen not only in America, but in Asia and in Africa as well. The ascension of William III is thus the turning point in American colonial history. Almost at once he set in motion that series of wars which ended in America 
only when the last vestige of french colonial empire had disappeared from the continent what he began marlborough and pitt and later generations completed influence upon america if we keep these facts in mind first that the navigation act of sixteen fifty one inaugurated a trade policy that was to build up the english carrying trade at the expense of the dutch and second that the ascension of william of orange as william the third of england marked the end of the rivalry between the english and the dutch and inaugurated the struggle between the english and the french oliver cromwell and william of orange become two of the most important figures in american history and therefore deserve far more attention than is usually accorded them in teaching american history for the further study of this phase of american history the student is recommended to the works of fisk and parkman and to the shorter treatises contained in the volumes of hart's american nation especially important however are the two works of professor j r seeley which have several times been quoted in this paper the growth of british policy and the expansion of england end of section twelve Section 13 of the History Teachers Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Annie Rue. The History Teachers Magazine, Volume 1, Number 2, October 1909, Section 13. A New Textbook on American History by James N. Sanford. Reviewed by John Sharpless Fox, Ph.D., of the University High School, Chicago. The new textbook by James and Sanford is an advanced and compendious manual for use in high schools. In it, the authors have escaped in some large measure the fault common to some of our older texts of writing an essay on American history. On the other hand, they have avoided the more grievous error of dumping a mass of undigested facts into their book they have borne in mind the important principle that generalizations to be useful must be accompanied by facts the how and the why are explained in this text and the authors do not assume an undue intimacy with providence it has been their aim they tell us to give the main features in the development of our nation to explain the america of to-day its civilization and its traditions they have sought to emphasize the achievements of men and women in the more important fields of human activity the political industrial educational and religious military phases of our history have been subordinated to the accounts of the victories of peace they have given unusual attention to the advance of the frontier and to the growth and influence of the west and particular care has been taken to state the essential facts in european history necessary to the explanation of events in america unlike some of our older books and the parson who announces his text and bids it adieu the authors have given no separate chapter or section to physical geography but have called attention to the influence of geographical conditions in connection with events and conditions as they arise in the opinion of the reviewer this method has received a large measure of justification in the event in the matter of proportion the authors have assigned much more space than is usual to the period following the civil war and considerably less to the period from seventeen eighty nine to eighteen sixty yet the latter does not suffer thereby the book is divided into chapters thirty one with appropriate titles and marginal notes indicate the contents of the paragraphs information of a more advanced and supplementary character has been placed in smaller type which may be omitted by teachers lacking time or at discretion it is not clear however why the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven should be relegated to this minor position colonial history the account of the thirteen colonies is of sufficient fullness to show clearly the origins of the people and their institutions 
it is however a matter of regret that the authors have not made it clear that the thirteen mainland colonies who won their independence were not the only english colonial establishments in america the discovery of america is made reasonable the varying motives of english and european colonization and the principal difficulties in the way of permanent settlement by europeans in america are clearly set forth the fact that the puritans were political as well as religious refugees of a practical character and not merely religious idealists is made clear the land systems prevailing in the different colonies are explained and the more general statement is made the great underlying economic fact of this colonization was the existence in america of boundless areas of cultivable land that might be had on easy terms the indians are treated in their contact with the whites and their degeneracy is made the occasion of general remarks on the inevitable consequences attending the contact between a superior and an inferior race here too the land question is shown to be fundamental the influence of the fur trade in this and later times is dwelt upon a notable statement of the seventeenth century colonial conditions and of eighteenth century problems occurs on pages one hundred one through one hundred two social and economic life receives unusual attention throughout the book and wherever possible is shown in its relation to physical conditions and environment the west receives the best treatment we have noted in any textbook excellent accounts of why settlers went to the west how they traveled how they obtained their land and of how western democracy arose and reacted on the east are here given the authors make no attempt to write down to their readers and we suspect that some of their economic discussions of international trade financial crises and monetary problems will overshoot the mark be it said however that things are everywhere reduced to their simplest terms something must be left to the teacher and to providence some of the other more important topics treated are progress in invention and labor-saving devices and their attendant effects on production the growth of commerce due to increased facilities for transportation the growth of capitalistic combinations corporations and trusts with their attendant problems of legislative regulation the rise of labor unions and their raison d'etre educational literary philanthropic and religious history are given due attention topics in biographical notes an excellent feature of the political and constitutional history is the presence of brief biographical sketches of important statesmen for teachers who prefer to teach american government in connection with the history special provision is made by means of marginal references and supplementary questions and an elaborate outline of topics arising in the text is added with appropriate references to the constitution and to the author's government in state and nation this is further supplemented by a list of topics related to other features of our government not naturally arising in a history course the book is provided with abundant and well-selected illustrations from authentic sources the maps are numerous and helpful but not distinctive at the end of each chapter are suggestive and stimulating topics and questions with references within compass of high school pupils these references are almost unique in that they are specific and brief a few inaccuracies and misleading statements have been noticed the statement there was no gold in this region referring to spanish territory in the united states should be modified none was found for eiler read tyler for cheney read cheney the remark respecting the slave trade that during colonial times no protest seems to have arisen against the wickedness and humanity of this traffic loses sight of the mennonite protest of sixteen eighty eight as well as the work and writings of john woolman anthony benezet and others finally connecticut is correctly stated democratic in the text but erroneously republican in the election map of eighteen seventy six taken as a whole the book is well adapted to its purpose the style is usually simple and direct facts are well selected and are clearly and impartially stated the scholarship is of a high order the index might be made fuller with profit citation american history by james alton james professor of history in northwestern university and albert hart sanford professor of history in the stevens point wisconsin state normal school new york charles scribner's son nineteen o nine 
End of section 13. Section 14 of the History Teacher's Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters. The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 2, October 1909, Section 14, Ancient History in the Secondary School, by William Fairley, Ph.D., Editor. Early Greece, Scope of the Month's Work. In our larger city schools, the work is so systematized that the teacher knows just how far along he should be at any season of the year. For teachers who are working by themselves in small schools and are not specialists in history, a very useful guide may be found in the History Syllabus for Secondary Schools, issued by the New England History Teachers Association and published by D.C. Heath and Company of Boston. The outline of ancient history, in pamphlet form, may be had by itself. One value of these outlines is that they divide the work into 100 exercises and then indicate the proportion of time this group of teachers have found it wise to devote to each section of the work. During October, the teacher ought to carry his class down to the Persian invasions and at least as far as the developments of Sparta. Importance of the Greeks It is hard for the cultured teacher to feel the difference between his own attitude toward Greece and that of the child of 14 or 15 who is approaching the subject for the first time. To such a child, Greece is simply a name as yet. And it would seem to be a good practice for the teacher in a simple talk to try to enlist the interest of his class by some statement of the reasons why we are going to devote nearly a half year to the study of a very little and today very obscure country. The teacher should show certain characteristics which make Greece of vast importance. Among these will be found the fact of the wonderful intellectual force of the Greeks which led them into the same lines of thought and investigation which interest the modern world, their love of independence in such marked contrast with the servility of the Oriental races at whose history we have been looking at in the past month, and especially their artistic supremacy, which made them the great masters in the creation of beauty for all time, and their masterpieces in architecture and sculpture should be contrasted with the work of Egyptians and Mesopotamians, for the most part so grotesque and unlovely. This article will not attempt to follow the month's lessons at all in detail, but will emphasize the main things which the young student should carry forward with him as the early story of this people who made themselves in so many ways the forerunners of our modern life. Map Work an early task is to become familiar with the physical characteristics of the land. Nothing will help better than map drawing. Relief maps are of great service as showing the mountainous nature and the effect of this on private and public life. Ancient Greece was about 250 miles in length from north to south and 165 miles at the most from east to west. It lies between the 36th and 40th parallels of latitude corresponding very closely in distance and latitude to our coast as it extends from the partition line of the Carolinas up as far as New York City. A comparison of the area of Greece with that of the pupil's own state is desirable. For instance, while the area of New York State is about 48,000 square miles, Greece contained but 21,000, and very early in the course the fact should be brought out that this tiny territory in the greatest days of its people was never united politically, but divided into rival states, really nations, each only about as large as one of our counties. A wholesome corrective to our American boastfulness over size may be found in the slightness of area and population of this marvelous land, which has contributed so many more than its proportionate share of mighty men. Races and Migrations Pelasgian Mycenaean, Achaean, Dorian, such was the order of the people who made Greece. The Greeks, or Hellenes, in whom our interest is centered, belong to the last of these two groups. The Pelasgians concern us in the high schools only as much as the men of the Stone Age in British history. The Mycenaeans we know only from the ruin of their towns, that in some respects they were ahead of the earlier Achaeans might be pointed out. 
the relationship of the historic greeks to the other races of europe and their kindred with ourselves are important we feel strains toward egyptian and babylonian but are cousins to the greeks the teacher who happens to know greek might show similarities of greek and english speech in the common homely words of everyday life epic myth and legend most of our pupils have heard in the lower schools something of homer and his iliad and odyssey and the stories of some of the gods and heroes are more or less familiar when the teacher comes to the homeric poems he will not be able to interest his young charges very much in their higher criticism but he would do well if time allow to use the special topic and report method here the story of the iliad the theme of the odyssey and certain characteristic episodes from each might be read to the class by pupils assigned to such duty a similar course may be taken with regard to the legends of the heroes and gods one interesting story read will be worth a week of mere recital of the twelve labors of hercules or the dry account of the fact that perseus had something to do with medusa and bellerophon with the chimera in these times of slighting the ancient world it is well to reflect how many of the commonest allusions of literature and even of political editorials depend for their meaning upon some knowledge of the greek stories we speak of hundred-handed briareus or of hundred-headed hydra evils of municipal mismanagement we talk of cleansing the augean stables cyclops siren gorgon chimera are household words we owe it to the children not to let them escape into life without some ability to grasp the content of such daily allusions early politics mention has already been made of the petty size of the typical greek state the marvel is that the greeks did so much while so divided we shall speak of city-states some child will run away with the notion of something like new york or boston with its suburbs make them feel that all greece never had as many people as new york city it was the intense greek individualism which kept the states apart the difference between greek individualism and that of the englishman or american should be indicated the latter is personal the greek was swallowed up in his state that was his unit and his love the progress through monarchy oligarchy and tyranny to democracy is rightly made much of in the books compare the tyrant with our boss when we come to the developments and the glories of the greek democracy a large degree of caution is needed in the writer's opinion there is a good deal of glamour about this so-called democracy the best greek never dreamed of manhood suffrage or of the rights of man as man in his view never were all men created free and equal athens in her best days had but thirty thousand voters and refused citizenship to all outsiders even fellow greeks from across the nearest borderline slavery was one of the cornerstones of society so far as it went the democracy of athens was of the pure type that should be made plain when reached while our modern democracy save for minor phases is representative and not pure the fact remains that the nineteenth century has brought to birth the only real democracy and that is one point of our superiority over the greeks and of more importance than our mechanical and scientific advantages west in his ancient world gives an excellent summary of the bonds which made the greek world one against all barbarians in spite of rivalries among their petty states he cites pages ninety five through ninety seven the common language and literature the belief in racial kinship the olympian religion with its gains oracles and amphictyonies as such forceful bonds of union the little land we know as greece was but a small part of the hellenic world doubtless the eastern shore of the aegean sea was as truly hellenic as attica or sparta and the colonies from that coast to massilia in the west and notably in sicily and magna graeca were of vast importance in spreading greek speech and ideals through the later roman world and down into modern times the political independence of the greek colony is of interest a good exercise for some student would be to point out how marseilles or syracuse or chalcis or cumai differed in their relation to the parent states from the relationship of the philippines to the united states or of canada or india to great britain 
and this topic is another illustration of the truth that save for a few cases like the successful resistance to the persians the service of the greeks to the world has been mainly in the intellectual rather than in the physical and political sphere end of section fourteen recording by april walters at aprilwalters dot com section fifteen of the history teachers magazine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano the history teachers magazine volume one number two october nineteen o nine section fifteen fowler's social life at rome social life at rome in the age of cicero fowler's recent work reviewed by professor a c howland this book on roman social life in the last generation of the republic by the well-known author of the city-state of the greeks and romans and other studies in ancient history will be welcomed by teachers both of roman history and of latin no other study in english deals with just this aspect of the period and the easy style and interesting method of presentation make the work especially valuable as collateral reading for classes its material has been drawn largely from cicero's correspondence and the results of widely scattered investigations have here been brought together and digested the first chapter is devoted to the topography of rome after a statement of the principal geographical causes for the growth of roman dominion pages four through eight there follows pages twelve through twenty three a description of the main points of interest within the walls in cicero's day the account being noteworthy alike for its clearness and for its omission of details a good map at the end of the book enables the reader to fix each feature of the city accurately the second chapter on the lower population is perhaps the most interesting in the book as it deals with a topic seldom discussed and on which our information is very meagre the subject is discussed under three heads how this population was housed how it was fed and clothed and how it was employed notwithstanding the contempt felt by the writers of the period for the lower classes mr fowler makes it evident that an understanding of their environment will explain many an obscure point in the history of the period why for instance had the old roman religion fallen into such decay at the close of the republic we naturally look for skepticism among the cultured where the old traditions had been undermined by the sudden influx of wealth and greek culture but not among the poor and ignorant who could have been little touched by such influences but when we consider the tenement houses in which the poor lived with whole families occupying but one or two rooms pages twenty eight through thirty two it can be seen that there is no place here for the penates or the family hearth that the old domestic rites which constituted the roman religion so far as it affected the individual were of necessity driven out and that the poorer classes were forced to satisfy their religious cravings by substituting the gregarious non-family oriental cults with their common temples and services here the worshippers could enter into personal relations with the deity as they could not in the indigenous roman temple which had to do solely with the state's worship the only other point around which the personal religious feeling of the old roman clung the family tomb likewise no longer existed for the poor roman of the city 
who could not afford this luxury but must see the members of his family cast into a common burying place with many others page three hundred and twenty as to the employment of the lower classes it is pointed out that in spite of the contempt for retail trade and the crafts a feeling similar to that of the higher classes in england and due to the same causes there were many callings at which free romans must have worked at this time including milling and baking market gardening shoemaking the making and washing of woolen clothing etc pages forty two through fifty five but the inadequacy of legal protection for the poor and the uncertainty of employment made a regular income precarious in chapter three there is given an excellent description of the activities and business organizations of the equites in their capacities both as public contractors pages sixty five through eighty and as private businessmen pages eighty through ninety four which throws much light on the sources of wealth and the financial methods of this class the following chapter on the governing aristocracy attempts to classify the various types of the nobility and to illustrate each by a brief sketch of some one of its members the attitude of the old and new nobility towards each other the effects for good and for evil of the greek culture on the various classes and the frivolity and absence of the sense of responsibility among the younger public men are well brought out the lively description of coelius the talented but scatter-brained young friend and pupil of cicero pages one twenty seven through thirty three is one of the most interesting passages of the book after thus taking up the different classes of the roman population the author proceeds to discuss the more general aspects of life of the day under such headings as marriage and the roman lady education of the upper classes the slave population the house of the rich man in town and country daily life of the well-to-do holidays and public amusements and religion the treatment throughout is fresh and vivid except in the chapter on public amusements which is rather uninteresting under the subject of marriage after a discussion of the decay of that institution and the increase of divorce and immorality we are especially grateful for the story of the long and beautiful wedded life as found in the so-called laudatio torie and now told in full in english for the first time pages one fifty eight through sixty seven there must have been similar cases of domestic devotion and happiness but they naturally pass unmentioned in the writings of the time as they largely do in the literature of our own day the discussion of roman education is valuable because it explains the weak points of the system and the way in which these produced many of the moral shortcomings in the men of the day the question of slavery is viewed from an unprejudiced standpoint its influence on the depopulation of the provinces is clearly brought out pages two o six through ten but it is also shown that its economic effects in italy were not altogether evil and that slave labor by no means drove free labor from the market pages two thirteen through twenty two the author holds with wallen footnote history de la escalavage end of footnote and seek footnote geschichte des untergangs der attican welt end of footnote that the unrestricted manumission of slaves had on the whole an injurious effect on roman life and character the roman idea of religion so puzzling to the average student is nowhere more clearly explained than in the last chapter and here as elsewhere the treatment is so simple and plain as well as scholarly that no better book can be placed in the hands of a class social life at rome in the age of cicero w ward fowler the macmillan company nineteen o nine page x one 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 three six two
End of Section 15 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 16 of The History Teacher's Magazine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano The History Teacher's Magazine Volume 1, Number 2, October 1909, Section 16 History in the Grades, The Columbus Lesson History in the Grades, Armand G. Gerson, Editor Columbus, Spanish Explorer A. Type Lesson if the lesson on Columbus is to be indeed a type lesson, it behooves the teacher in preparing it to make a careful selection of such elements of the story as may properly form the basis for the subsequent teaching of other Spanish explorers, as was pointed out in this department in last month's issue. Footnote. The Type Lesson in History. History Teacher's Magazine. September. 1909. End of footnote. The truest economy in history teaching consists in the careful construction of a definite foundation of correct historical concepts upon which the detailed superstructure of later lessons may be rapidly and yet substantially reared. Certain elements in the life, environment, and explorations of Christopher Columbus may well be used as the foundation for the teaching of all the Spanish explorations of the New World. These essential elements should be presented with great thoroughness, and the children's interest in them made active and enthusiastic. Their knowledge of them must be concrete, many-sided, living. Only then will it constitute what the psychologist likes to call the aperceptive basis for subsequent analysis, comparison, and generalization. On the other hand, the teaching of Columbus will necessarily involve many facts which belong distinctively to his life and actions, and to which later Spanish explorations have little, or at the most a very remote, relation. It is obvious that the teaching of such portions of our topic can hardly be said to constitute a type lesson these points serve a definite purpose of their own and should be presented in their own let us therefore in our practical consideration of the presentation of our lesson on columbus consider separately the type elements and what for convenience we may call the specific elements previous preparation in the first place in the preparation of our lesson on columbus as in fact in the preparation of any lesson the teacher must have definitely in mind just what preliminary instruction has been given let us assume then that the soil has been prepared that the class is already familiar with the ideas of the size and shape of the earth which were current in the fifteenth century with the parts of the world that were known with the general geographical situation of the chief nations of europe with the nature of the trade with the Far East, and, still more important, with the causes of the activity of the time in the direction of finding new trade routes to the Orient. These basic ideas should have become firmly fixed and their interrelations clearly brought out before we introduce our Columbus-type lesson. What are the essential features of the Columbus lesson, the emphasis of which will entitle it to be considered a type lesson? or to rephrase our query what are the type elements of the story of columbus spanish characteristics first of all if our lesson is to typify the spanish explorers as a group it should supply a basic concept of spanish life and character in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries 
it is not a matter of much difficulty to arouse in our pupils a real interest in the spaniards of that time there is so much of the romantic and the picturesque about this phase of american history that for the conscientious teacher it will always constitute one of the most attractive portions of his work varied selections from literature suitable to the age of the children should be read to them better still they should be encouraged to continue this sort of reading on their own accounts appropriate material for this purpose should be on hand in the school library the religious element in spanish life should receive particular emphasis some reference being made to the inquisition and the popular attitude toward heresy as an important element in the european background of american history this phase of our subject dare not be overlooked but it goes without saying that in our public schools it is a topic which must be handled with extreme tact the severe etiquette of the spanish court the spanish dress spanish arms and armor should all receive their proper amount of attention pictures as well as stories should be brought into constant requisition to make this portion of the work concrete some notion of the political standing and relations of spain properly adapted to children of elementary school age must also be considered as essentially a type element in our lesson for pupils in the grades it will probably suffice to point out very briefly the long struggle with the moors brought to a successful termination by ferdinand and isabella in 1492 the combination in the sixteenth century of various and widely separate realms under the Habsburgs, and the natural jealousy of France and England toward this rising world power. The next type element necessary to consider will be the topic of Spanish modes of navigation. At this point our lesson becomes typical of the period of exploration in general, rather than of Spanish explorations in particular. Inasmuch as Spanish vessels, sailors, etc., were not, for our purposes in the grades at least, essentially different from those of other contemporary nations. It is important, however, that our pupils should have definite ideas on this point. If their knowledge of the early explorations is to be in any true sense real, pictures of Spanish vessels of the period are easy to procure, and should be referred to in this connection attention should be called to the significant features of these boats their small size their peculiar construction their usual rate of speed etc in all purely descriptive work of this sort it is well for the teacher to keep in mind that a happy comparison is frequently of more value than pages of prosy details and measurements take for example mark twain's delightful comparison in his description of one of the pyramids each stone as big as a freight car finally the prevailing superstitious fears of unknown seas wild notions regarding the monsters of the deep and inhabitants of distant lands the consequent scarcity of sailors for voyages of exploration the bravery and steadfastness of purpose required to lead such an expedition these points may surely be said to constitute a type element to be sure as time went on and ignorance of distant regions gradually disappeared the force of these factors in history diminished throughout the exploration period however they remain an element to be reckoned with and constantly to be referred to selections from mandeville might very appropriately be read in this connection to lend color and life to the presentation life of columbus we are now ready to consider what we have designated the specific elements of the columbus lesson that is those features of the story that refer to columbus as an individual explorer but can hardly be considered typical of the spanish explorations in general if the type elements have been duly impressed this portion of the lesson will present little difficulty and can be covered in a comparatively short time largely in fact 
in the form of readings. The nationality and early life of Columbus should first occupy the attention of teacher and class. The fact that he was an Italian is significant. Passing reference might well be made to the political disorganization of Italy and the declining importance of its commercial centers. The boyhood of our hero is picturesque and may easily be made to arouse the interest of boys and girls of our own day. Let them feel that he was a child like themselves and give them some appreciation of his childhood environment, the Italian sky and sea coast. The geographical ideas of Columbus and the development of his pet project have a definite relation in the preliminary lessons on the geographical notions of his time. His errors should be clearly pointed out. In this portion of the presentation, as in most others, a good wall map must be on hand for constant reference. The futile attempts of Columbus to get the support necessary for his venture need not occupy us long. His experience at the court of Spain, however, and his first voyage, will require more elaborate treatment. Here, constant reference must be made to the type elements, particularly in a connection with Spanish court life. Spanish motives, the furnishing and manning of the three boats which constituted his fleet. The subsequent voyages of Columbus may be passed over very rapidly, preferably with very little detail. Similarly, his later life and his sad death will call for but passing notice. This entire narrative portion of our topic is largely handled for us by any of the standard elementary textbooks, which, by the way, it is important that our pupils should learn to use. The real teaching, that is to say, the history tracing and idea building, has been accomplished in connection with the type elements. The rest of the problem in large measure solves itself. The type lesson on Columbus, just outlined, will occupy a number of history periods. It is important that it should not be hurried. The old pedagogic maxim that we should make haste slowly applies with peculiar force to the type lesson method. We begin slowly that we may gain time later. More than that, we are furnishing our pupils with a definite stock of fundamental historical notions, which will constitute for them a genuine intellectual capital. As they go on with the study of history, they will find that their type ideas help to interpret the detailed facts they meet, which facts in turn will tend to reinforce the type ideas. End of section 16 Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 17 of the History Teachers Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The History Teachers Magazine. Volume 1, Number 2, October 1909. Section 17. Reports from the Historical Field. Walter H. Cushing, Editor. A New Organization. The history teachers of Colorado are about to organize an association and have appointed a committee of which Professor James G. Willard is chairman. With so many questions in history teaching still unsettled, we welcome a new organization which by discussion and interchange of views will hasten the solution of these problems the history teachers in about one-half the states of the union are now included in organizations with the american historical association as a sort of clearinghouse raising the standard in louisiana heretofore the state course of study has not provided for a satisfactory history program in the high school but with this year a new course of study goes into operation which gives about three years to history at the request of the state department of education professor walter l fleming of the state university has prepared a syllabus covering the work with suggestions for map work reading notebooks etc in the future 
two or even three years work in history may be required of the candidates for the freshman class considerable interest has been developed in certain fields of history by the rally day competition at the university the high schools of the state send representatives to the high school rally day at the university in april these pupils are chosen after local contests and sent to baton rouge the pupil subjects for the debate and essay contests are published by the program committee to prepare teachers adequately for their work two courses are offered at the state university one in methods of teaching history and another in aids in the studying and teaching of history instruction covers use of texts sources reference works map work pictures advertising material useful in history teaching etc great improvement is already noticeable and especially good work is done in shreveport and new orleans proceedings of the north central history teachers association the annual report of this association containing the papers and discussions of the april meeting was issued during the summer as usual it contains much which will repay careful reading and reflection even by those who were fortunate enough to be present at the meeting professor samuel b harding of indiana university in treating of some concrete problems in the teaching of medieval and modern history opposed the plan of teaching this field of history on the single nation plan with regard to the proportion of time to be allotted the parts of this course he advocated giving roughly one-third to the period eight hundred a d to fifteen hundred a d another one-third to the period ending with seventeen eighty nine and the final one-third to the french revolution and the nineteenth century he suggested several devices for emphasizing the time problem or chronology urged the use of maps and especially called attention to the greatest problem how to make history concrete how to make it definite the speaker advocated the regular use of notebooks and urged a greater use of pictures in considering what changes should be made in the report of the committee of seven professor a c mclaughlin referred to the complaint especially in the east against the great length of the course in ancient history he gave reasons why it had seemed desirable to the committee of seven to continue the study of roman history to eight hundred a d and predicted that the committee of five will cling to that year but recommend more decidedly and with more assurance than did the earlier report the somewhat hasty perusal of the period from three hundred to eight hundred it may be desirable to state very distinctly and definitely what topics should be taken up the most perplexing question is how the general history of western europe should be treated from eight hundred or thereabouts to the present time the speaker would not change the general arrangement of the four blocks recommended in the old report but advised a very hurried treatment of the first six or eight hundred years compare professor harding above there are serious objections to giving up a continuous and unbroken treatment of english history as is sometimes recommended in its recommendation on civil government the committee of seven seems to have been misunderstood the old report did not advise that separate courses in civil government should not be given it urged a strong combined course in american history and government in preference to two separate weak courses in any case they should be taught as interrelated and interdependent subjects at the business meeting of the association carl e prey of the normal school milwaukee was elected president and george h gaston of the wendell phillips high school chicago was re-elected secretary a syllabus in civil government for secondary schools considerable interest has been aroused in the forthcoming syllabus in civil government prepared by a special committee of the new england history teachers association for whom it will be published late in the fall by the macmillan company there will be two parts to the book an introduction of about twenty pages given to a discussion of the general subject and representing in a limited field the relation that the report of the committee of seven bore to the history syllabus and the syllabus proper 
consisting of approximately one hundred and twenty pages with topics diagrams general and specific references and bibliographies specimen pages of the syllabus have been tried in the classrooms of schools in widely different parts of the country and the subject was discussed at the april meeting of the association many problems confronted the committee at the outset and at least a working agreement had to be reached upon the following questions one what should be the position of the study and what time allotment should it reasonably expect two what should be the aims of instruction in government in secondary schools three what should be the scope and what should be the places of emphasis four what should be its relation to other subjects of the curriculum five what should be the point of attack and order of topics six what should be the method seven what should be the form of the syllabus the conclusions reached by the committee may be briefly summarized two or two and one half forty-five minute periods a week should be allotted and the subject should be correlated with united states history instruction in civics should aim to train the mind to develop political intelligence to awaken civic consciousness to interest the pupil in civic duty and to prepare him through instruction and practice for its exercise the scope of the subject should include actual government as found in the local unit the state and the nation with so much of the history of government as is needed to explain present institutions and conditions enough of the theory of government should be given to establish an orderly arrangement of the subject matter in the pupil's mind the ethical principles underlying government should be examined in a concrete way and attention should be given to the application of these principles in the social duties of school life civics should not be confounded with constitutional history it is important enough to have its own field and while correlated with history economics and ethics should not be trammeled by either of these the most serious problem which the committee had to solve was that of the order of topics should local or national government come first the majority of the committee favored local state national as the order they also decided that not more than one-fourth of the time should be given to a study of the federal government much stress is laid on the importance of studying local government so far as possible at first hand this necessitates frequent systematically planned visits to local bodies and careful study of local documents such as reports specimen papers etc no hard and fast form for the syllabus has been used sometimes topics sometimes questions and again statements are used wherever best adapted to the purpose the committee consists of dr hay green hewling english high school cambridge chairman wilson r butler high school new bedford professor l b evans tufts college dr john haynes dorchester high school dr w b monroe harvard university mr butler is editor for the committee report of the committee of eight this report on history in the elementary grades has been prepared by a committee of the american historical association professor james a james of northwestern university chairman and will be published this fall by scribner's the work for each of the eight grades is treated in detailed topics accompanied by reading lists for teachers and for pupils the object of the course for the first two grades is to give the child an impression of primitive life and an appreciation of public holidays grade three deals with heroes of other times columbus and the indians in the fourth and fifth grades emphasis is placed on historical scenes and persons in american history the object sought in grade six is to impress on the child's mind that the beginnings of american ways of living are to be sought far back in the story of the world the topics therefore seek to bring out the contributions made by greeks romans and the people of medieval europe especially england closing with the defeat of the spanish armada the seventh grade topics deal with the exploration and settlement of north america 
and the growth of the colonies to seventeen sixty three the eighth grade topics bring united states history down to the present time and suggest subjects for supplementary talks on european history the report also contains a chapter on methods an outline for teaching the development of a constitutional government in the eighth grade in three lessons of forty minutes each contributed by miss blanche a cheney of the lowell massachusetts state normal school an outline for teaching the birth of the german nation in the eighth grade by miss blanche e hazard of the brockton massachusetts high school an article on elementary civics and appendices on history teaching in german french and english elementary schools the subject of history in the elementary grades has also been treated in a stimulating manner in a course prepared by superintendent w f gordy for the schools of springfield massachusetts the work is here outlined for nine grades the last being devoted to english history as related to the history of our own country new england association the next meeting of the new england history teachers association will be held on saturday october sixteenth in boston the council seriously considered for a time the expediency of waiving the constitutional requirement and holding the meeting in the western part of massachusetts probably in greenfield the preference of a large minority of the members for boston however led the council to follow the regular practice of holding the annual meeting in boston the association has held meetings in springfield hartford and portland and the wisdom of meeting once a year outside of boston seems proved by the large attendance at those places had the meeting been held in greenfield the subject would have been local aids in the study of history a most appropriate topic for a meeting in that richly historical region for the boston meeting the council has selected the subject of economics which has been clamoring for recognition ever since the association was founded topics in economics enter to a considerable extent into american history but it is a question how far economic theory should be developed in a secondary school course the field is a tempting one to a teacher filled with his subject the fundamental principles of money foreign trade rent capital and labor corporate organization socialism these and many others the young man will inevitably come in contact with daily what guidance shall he have and where shall he obtain it bibliographies of considerable value to all progressive teachers of history is the annual list of books on history and civics selected and critically reviewed with reference to their value for high school teachers and pupils prepared by a special committee of the north central association under the editorship of professor w j chase of the university of wisconsin the list comprises new books on teaching history ancient medieval and modern english history and government united states history and government each title is accompanied by name of publisher and price there is a critical estimate averaging half a page textbooks and special treatises on a small field are not included copies may be obtained of mr g h gaston wendell phillips high school chicago for twenty five cents the atlantic educational journal published by the maryland educational publishing company baltimore maryland has a bibliography of history for schools prepared by a committee of the association of history teachers of maryland under the chairmanship of professor c m andrews the macmillan company published in june the valuable bibliography prepared by miss grace gardner griffin entitled writings on american history nineteen hundred seven this is the second year of the publication of the work in this form the volume contains a bibliography of books and articles upon continental united states and canada and some references to other portions of america dr j franklin jameson of the carnegie institution of washington has again supervised the making of the yearbook a new commercial geography is announced by henry holt and company as in course of preparation by dr john p good assistant professor of geography in the university of chicago 
exchange of professors in the summer schools an excellent result of the establishment of summer schools has been the interchange of the teaching forces of colleges and universities and on a minor scale the employment of strong secondary school men in summer college courses much has been made of the international exchange of professors recently brought about but unconsciously within our own country there has been established a custom which must prove very valuable not alone to institutions inviting outside instructors but also to those instructors themselves and to their own institutions thus taking the history men alone last summer harvard was represented at the university of california yale at wisconsin leland stanford at kansas columbia at chicago wisconsin at illinois university of the south at michigan indiana university at cornell michigan at chicago brown at harvard and pennsylvania at columbia such an exchange of instructors cannot but bring about a mutual education and when it is remembered that the same policy of exchange is going on in many other subjects in history it will be seen that we have here a great power for good messrs ginn and company are continuing the excellent undertaking of furnishing source material for history teachers and scholars which they began so auspiciously with professor robinson's readings in european history and followed with robinson and beard's readings in modern european history professor cheney's readings in english history was reviewed in the september number the same publishers now announced two new books selections from the economic history of the united states seventeen sixty to eighteen sixty by professor guy s collander of yale university and readings on american federal government by professor paul s reinch of the university of wisconsin an american historical series made up of textbooks that will be comprehensive systematic and authoritative is announced by messrs henry holt and company the publishers of the well-known american science series in the new series professor colby of mcgill university will prepare a book on medieval and modern europe and one on the renaissance and reformation professor s b fay of dartmouth college is at work upon a volume entitled europe in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries professor r c h catterall of cornell will treat of the french revolution and napoleon and professor c d hazen of smith college will write the volume upon europe in the nineteenth century there will be also a history of the united states by professor frederick j turner a history of greece by professor paul shorey and a history of rome by director jesse b carter end of section seventeen section eighteen of the history teachers magazine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the history teachers magazine volume one number two october nineteen hundred nine section eighteen correspondence editor history teachers magazine allow me to congratulate you on the quality of your first number of the history teachers magazine i am specially delighted to see the simplicity of style in all the articles it seems to me that a reader wholly untrained in history ought to be able to follow each article with comparative ease most of the articles might have been written so that none but specialists would appreciate them s a d editor history teachers magazine i notice in your magazine an account of the translations and reprints from the series of european history covering the period from the roman times to the nineteenth century do you know of any work similar to this covering the period of ancient history m c s answer there are two good source books on ancient history published by d c heath and company entitled monroe's source book of roman history and fling's source book of greek history editor history teachers magazine 
will you kindly give the publisher of cheney's european background of american history and ferrand's basis of american history l b m answer cheney's work is volume one in hart's american nation ferrand's is volume two in the same series the work is published by harper's and the volumes can be bought separately editor history teachers magazine can you refer me to a short work giving an account of the migrations of the barbarians answer the writer knows of no primer or handbook upon the barbarian invasions one of the best of the accounts is that in emerton's introduction to the middle ages shorter but very good is the chapter in robinson's introduction to the history of western europe more detailed accounts with other matter interspersed will be found in hodgkin's dynasty of theodosius and in oman's the dark ages extended accounts will of course be found in sargent's the franks hodgkin's theodoric Valari's barbarian invaders of italy hodgkin's italy and her invaders and in bury's later roman empire and his edition of gibbon there is a short work by rev william h hutton entitled the church and the barbarians an excellent word picture of the invasions is to be found in freytag's builder os dem mittelalter editor history teachers magazine i was interested in your history teachers magazine and will hand it to our history teacher i write asking you to recommend some periodicals for english teachers of a similar nature answer we know of no periodical for english teachers exactly similar to our own the following magazines are largely devoted to research rather than to practical methods of teaching english modern language notes baltimore maryland eight months a year one dollar fifty cents a year modern philology university of chicago press quarterly three dollars a year modern language review cambridge england twelve shillings sixpence publications of the modern language association of america cambridge massachusetts end of section eighteen end of the history teachers magazine volume one number two october nineteen hundred nine